add a context summary. Thanks for the reminder. I was just going to launch into the game. Another slap is dealt out. Kiryu gets acupuncture. Emphasis on the puncture. And Haruka goes gambling. I'm not surprised about Haruka. First she hits up three <laughs> different bars and now she's gambling. What's next? She's going to take down a drug lord. Time will tell. Thank you for coming back from our replay reviews. My name is Leah. And my name is Kathy. We are two friends who are here to replay, review, and analyze your favorite video games. And since Kathy has never seen the games before, it helps me view them through her fresh eyes, almost like I'm discovering them again for the first time. We hope it will be a similar experience for you. So I test, uh, I test the hidden Majimas out on you. Mm-hmm. It took you a while in this week's. I'm going to say that it's the blurry screen from our screen share, and that's the reason why I couldn't find it. Yeah. It's definitely easier to see in the program I create them with. Yeah. But it's getting trickier. We bought ourselves some Majima Everywhere t-shirts. Yes. And we're thinking uh, that'll be part of the prize, right, Kathy? Mm-hmm. It's a very fitting prize. We'll probably add something else to it, but if you want mm. an adorable Majima t-shirt, tell us where he is and you might win. That sounded like a threat, but it was supposed to be an invitation. <laughs> Should we jump into scene one? Yes. So we're back in time again, back to Nishiki. He runs into none other than Big Baby Shimano. He provides another perspective on Kazuma telling Nishiki... If he really meant to help you come up, then why'd he give you men you can't control? Does he have a point? I was just about to say he has a point. Okay. But at the same time, is Shimano just blowing it up to mm -hmm. manipulate the situation mm -hmm. and trying to get Nishiki to go up against Kazama and hitting the two brothers to against each other? He's really catching Nishiki at a really bad time. He's just not in the right mindset. His sister's dying. His brother's in jail. And Yumi's missing. I definitely think he's trying to stir the pot. I mean, it's Shimano. He's always up to something. But he does kind of have a point at the same time. And so he might be stirring the pot, but like the ingredients, they're already in there. Mm -hmm. Do you think Nishiki knows subconsciously that this has been happening? He's kind of being used by Kazuma, and then when Shimano says it, he sort of has to face the facts and he can't ignore it anymore? I don't think so, because Nishiki looks shocked as if he's hearing it for the first time. I don't think this is something that he's already been contemplating. Shimano is, like, really going at him, though. He says that he's worthless, <laughs> that nobody knows what to do with him. Well, he's just trying to piss him off enough to, to really stir yeah. the pot. So what is the motive, you think, just to knock Kazuma off? Uh, cause a civil war to have Kazuma to have one less person. Because besides mm -hmm. Kashiwaki, he knows that the next two most loyal people is Kiryu and Nishiki. And Kiryu's in jail, so it's a great opportunity to separate Nishiki. That's another point, because he says that because of killing Dojima, Kiryu has more street cred than he ever has. Mm -hmm. And then he tells Nishiki that he's useless because he can't pull the trigger. But we know, and Nishiki knows, that he's actually the one that killed Dojima. Kiryu's being praised for something that Nishiki actually did. Do you think Shimano knows and is just trying to piss Nishiki enough to say that I'm the one who actually pulled the trigger? What are you talking about? And then Shimano's gonna like, aha, you fessed up the truth and now I'm gonna hold this over your head. I don't think he knows, but either way, it's a win-win. If he does think so and he's wrong, he can still make Nishiki angry with Kiryu. And mm -hmm. if he's right, then he outs Nishiki. So it's it's a win-win. Even if it's just a hunch, he has no reason to not explore that. Mm -hmm. Date shows Kiryu a picture of a tattoo that was on the body of a woman the police discovered murdered. The tattoo appears to be Mizuki's, and Kiryu recognizes the tattoo artist's signature. So he goes to pay him a visit. I really thought that that tattoo would be a sunflower, and I'm disappointed <laughs> to see it wasn't a sunflower. So at the tattoo shop, the owner says that the tattoo that Kiri has a picture of was not done by him, but it was one of his designs. The tattoo shop owner then gets a call. Turns out it's Nishi on the other end wanting to talk to Kiryu. 
He mentions Mizuki as if he knows what's going on. And then he wants to meet Kiryu at Serena tomorrow at 10 p.m. Man to man, because they need to talk. What are you feeling? You just made a face. <laughs> I'm like, can you just see it over the phone? I feel like at that time period, they didn't really tap phone lines. They could have just got it over with. Why do you need to talk in person? Well, I, I get know. it, but I, yeah. I get it. It's like there's nothing. It's different. They have to size each other up. It's been 10 years. Yeah. But it's also like, how does Nishiki know? I feel like we're not really getting the full story about how he knows. Yeah. He just alludes like, oh, I'm super powerful. So information just swirls all around me, basically. But BS. yeah, that's kind of a vague, a vague reason. Sorry, I should not have just yawned right into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all good. So then they start talking about Kiryu Nishiki's tattoos, and the shop owner tells the same story that we discussed in our tattoo analysis of these two characters last season in Yakuza 0. The koi swims up the river to eventually ascend into becoming the dragon. And I think I might have talked about this when we were discussing their tattoos, but it's almost like they, they need each other to be who they are. Because the koi turns into the dragon, so it's like Nishiki turns into Kiryu. So Kiryu couldn't be the dragon without first being involved with the koi. So it's almost like they need each other to become who they are. These top tier Yakuza. Their connection seems deep, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. But the question is, why didn't they both start as dragons? You know what I mean? Like I, I know the right. koi turns into it, but if Kiryu started as having the dragon tattoo, doesn't that put him a leg up above Nishiki since the beginning of time? You would think they were both equal, but it almost mm -hmm. sounds like it wasn't. And I understand that he does, the Koi does turn into the dragon, but it's like five steps behind the dragon. I even think in Y0, they talk about like only so many people can have the dragon tattoo, or maybe it's even in this game. And so what is so special about Kiryu? Back in 89 or whatever year that was, where he gets that tattoo. What's so special about him at that point? Because that's even like his origin story. What did he do to deserve that? And what did Nishiki not do to deserve starting at the bottom? What if it was just a simple game of raw paper scissors? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to the Japanese dictionary okay. to Google their names. Because I think Nishiki is like a Nishiki Koi is a thing. Oh. And I think that might be why he went with the koi, perhaps. Colored carp, yeah. So Anishki is a koi. Or a splendid garden eel. That's what we talked about when we did Yakuza Sero's tattoo analysis. That might be the reason why. Because our big question is, why is Nishiki not getting any of the credit? And why is he the one who has to start like ground, ground floor, seemingly? But I think it's just because it relates to his name. I think that's the theory we're going to go to. And... I mean, part of Kiryu's name has dragon in it. Isn't Ryu dragon? Do you ever know about Nishiki and Kiryu's parents? I'm wondering if their parents had any Yakuza ties. That I'm going to ask you to not ask me that question okay. right now. Because <laughs> I don't want you looking at my face. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I did see something change, which is really funny because you have a poker face most of the time when... <laughs> when you're in, like, meetings and everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, we're back at Serena. Haruka makes it clear to Kiryu that she thinks he doesn't care about her. He just wants the pendant that she has because it can lead him to the 10 billion yen. This hurts Kiryu's feelings, but he perhaps reacts in a less than ideal fashion. A less than ideal <laughs> fashion? Can't be. You're so mad. I am, like, so Bidding fire angry at this. Okay, you keep going first. Explain the rest of Oh, yourself. that's funny. Oh. He, he slaps her across the face. That's pretty much, I mean. He does like a quick, like, sorry, but like, does that really count? <laughs> Similar reaction as I had, but kind of worse than when Nishiki slapped Reina because, first of all, she's a child. Control your temper. Not even your child, someone else's child. Yeah. And the child just lost her mom. Right. Right? Well, like, yeah, she doesn't know that yet, but... I don't even know how to 
verbalize how I'm feeling with this one. The reaction I had was pretty darn similar to when Nishiki slapped <laughs> Rina. And they're like, they're cut from the same cloth. Like, what were they putting yeah. in the water at Sunflower Orphanage? Or what were they teaching the boys there? <laughs> I just, watching that scene, and maybe we'll cut the audio in. <gasps> no! <laughs> Pause. No! Okay. What is wrong with these people? What is wrong with them? No. <laughs> no. I feel like Michael Scott's screaming no right now. I will say, if I can compare your reactions from memory, you were more surprised and shocked at Nishiki. Yeah. Um, And here you were more just mad. It was like out of character from what I thought of Nishiki and Yakuza Zero, so I was shocked. Here's my biggest issue with this. He didn't hit Majima, who berated his noggin with an umbrella until right? he drew blood. Right? You're staying calm in that situation, and in all these situations in Y Zero, you restrain yourself only to slap a child across the face. I get that jail changes you after a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get attacked with a fork, you're you're <laughs> changed forever. Right? But she's a child. My goodness. Okay, so let's talk about this, though, because we are, uh, at this point, seven chapters into the game. We've already seen three times where a man slaps a woman in the face. Not okay. So let's discuss. <laughs> let's discuss. In two situations, it's, uh, well, one literal father and one, like, father figure, protector, guardian type situation. And then with Nishiki, that's different. That's like a friend. So... Here's why I get confused, because I'm like, oh, is slapping your child just a normal form of discipline at this time in Japan? But then that's where I get confused, because the Nishiki slap is not about discipline. He's upset. He's angry. He's emotional. I, I want to add to that. It's not yeah. about like anger, frustration. It's about that they feel like the other person is disrespecting them. He feels like she's implying that he's useless and that's disrespect. Kiryu probably thinks that Haruka isn't respecting his authority. Did you mm -hmm. say it, it's happened three times already? What was the third time? Yeah, we saw Date slap his daughter. Oh, yeah. But again, that's out of discipline, control. Like, how stupid are you? That's yeah. maybe the most understandable one. But that's where I get confused because we've seen three slaps and so we're like, okay, what's the game adding these in here for? But there's not really a connection. I will say it's ironic that he thinks that Haruka doesn't believe him when he says that he cares for him. And so he slaps him, which obviously shows <laughs> that you really don't care for her. It was the wrong move. He does apologize. A useless apology. Yeah, it was too late. It was very bad. There are a few things in the series that you're just like, what? What the hell? But I think we've uh, we've beat this. We've we've slapped this horse to death. Um, <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Haruka's had enough. Fair enough. And she runs out of the bar, leaving the pendant. And then they just sit there and watch her run away. And then they're surprised when they slowly saunter out into the street and don't see her. Why didn't you run after her immediately? Why did you just watch her leave? Worst fathers ever. Those two. Anything before they start tracking her down. Well, okay, I will say that out of the three of them, she is the most mature. Uh, what did she say? I didn't come to play. And then later she slaps a pendant onto like, the counter like mm -hmm. a boss. And I'm calling it. She's going to be a Yakuza boss in the future. She does have a more level head. And I don't know if it's because as a child, she doesn't have the full scope of everything that's happening. And if she's just so single-minded on finding her mother that she's not having to consider all these other aspects that Kiryu and Date are. I think that might be part of it. But I also think that she's just really cool. A child that can take a slap and not immediately cry. That's a win. That's a good kid. So Kiryu and Date track down Haruka's last known location. And when they arrive, a man is waiting for them. So he takes them to Stardust, where more men are waiting. And they refuse to say what organization they're with. But they want to exchange Haruka for the pendant that Kiryu now has. They make the exchange. It doesn't quite go as planned. He tosses the pendant over Haruka's head, who is halfway down the stairs to him. Date runs, because I guess he knows that they're going to shoot her. The bullet grazes her arm, but she's otherwise okay. And then, of course, Kiryu has to fight off a small army. 
it's a bit frustrating because Date knows that they're going to shoot Haruka, yet they still proceed with it. There's so many ways this could have gone differently, yet they continue mm-hmm. going the path knowing that they're going to get shot at. Shouldn't Date have a gun as a detective? Right? Yeah. So many other issues there, too. <laughs> Well, I think they told him at the end of last episode to stop working on the case. So maybe now he has to sort of step away from some of his resources. But he should still have a gun, right? Kiryu's got one guy still conscious and he tries to get the name of their organization out of them. And all we hear is Jin. (laughs) But it's cut off. So we don't know the rest of the word. And then one of his brothers in arms just uh, shoots him in the head. So a secret is safe for now. Do you have any theories on who these people are? Probably not Tojo clan, but another clan that's probably trying to take over. It's my guess for now. Or Shimano's people. I feel like Shimano has spies everywhere. I believe all we were told at this point is that they're not Yakuza. Here you says you're not Yakuza, who are you with? So that's interesting. Why is another organization getting involved? I do want to say that if it's not Yakuza and they know about the pendant, then it can only lead to Mizuki or Yumi having some kind of ties or getting into some kind of trouble with another organization. And they're here to take that 10 million or 10 billion. At this point, Haruka realizes that Kiryu really does care about her. And Kiryu breaks the news to Haruka that her mother is already dead. And then Haruka, like... It's pretty cute. Touches his face and he looks up at her. But then she shakes her head. What is that about? It, like, she knows something. That's what I was thinking, too. I don't know what kind of theories I was talking about in the previous parts. But I do insist on Mizuki not being dead. It's probably some kind of news that just got out there. Just so that people aren't looking for dead people. And it's her way of getting around. <laughs> it's weird. It seems like she knows that her mother is not dead, but we could also just be completely misreading that. (laughs) Anyway, Kiryu and Date hide Haruka with a florist so that she will be safe from further kidnappings. We'll see about that. All right, so at the start of scene three, we see a quick moment between Date and Sudo, who again tries to get Date to step away from the Sarah investigation. But Date implies that Sudo doesn't know what the truth is. What do you think of this dynamic so far? It's almost like the same kind of political dynamics within their organization is similar to how the Yakuza is. Is that you're constantly trying to have more power than someone else. And so Mm -hmm. it's like a funny parallel that you can be on the wrong side of the law or on the right side of the law. Yet things you are feeling and doing and competing with everyone is going to be the same no matter what industry you're in Mm -hmm. and so i feel like well because it's about people right like Mm -hmm. you could be a copper yakuza like there's there's decent individuals Mm -hmm. in any organization and there's not so decent individuals Mm -hmm. in any organization generally speaking Mm -hmm. i did notice though pseudo said that he was going to keep his eye on date so i don't know what to think of when majima said i because Sudo has two eyes, so I don't know if that was a joke at the beginning or not. We'll let you all decide. Back to Purgatory. Date suggests that Kiryu take Hark out for some fun. Because laughter is the best medicine for a bullet wound. And naturally, he takes her gambling. And the night ends in a brawl. First of all, if they're trying to hide, why the heck are you dragging her all through the streets? Why are you putting her in more danger? Yeah, and a shady secret backdoor gambling hall does not yeah. seem like the best location. Seriously. After that, it's time for Hiri to go meet Nishiki. So he leaves Haruka with Date in the florist and heads to Serena. Nishiki asks Kiryu to hand over Haruka and the pendant. He wants the $10 billion. But Kiryu slightly changes the subject and asks Nishiki why he killed Mizuki. And Nishiki responds that he didn't mean to. And then we see a flashback, and it turns out that some of his men killed her on accident while torturing her. And Nishiki is not happy about it. He, um, well, he shoots one of them in the face. Okay, that's bad enough. And then he just unloads into the other guy. Would we ever have seen Y0 Nishiki do anything like this? 
No, this is an older Nishiki, but this is also Nishiki who's experienced a lot of loss, betrayal, anger, and frustration. A lot has evolved. We don't really know what he's gone through since then. Mm -hmm. And why he was even okay with torturing the sister of his childhood friend and potential crush. It seems like he did like Yumi, but Yumi liked Kiryu, so I feel like it's jealousy. But like he also doesn't clarify that it wasn't him who killed Misuki. I think he told the story that we see just based off of Reina's reaction. So I'm assuming that he sort of told that story. I mean, he still had his men torturing her. Mm -hmm. So he's not in the clear, you know, even if he didn't pull the trigger. Nishiki then says that he's betrayed Kiryu and Kazuma and he can't go back now. And this is when Kiryu learns that Nishiki, who confirms it, is the one who shot Kazuma. Kiryu punches the daylight out of Nishiki Mm -hmm. to the floor. Full he strength. deserved it. He did. He deserved it. But then he just gets up off the floor and continues the conversation. <laughs> Unfazed. But Kiri refuses to betray Haruka, and he and Nishiki are at an impasse, and this is when Nishiki says that Kiryu is no longer a brother of mine. Every time we've been in this bar, the door is closed. In this scene, it's open. Why is the door open in this one scene? Here's my theory, if we can dive into some symbolism here. Before this, their old relationship, the old Kiryonishiki, they were comfortable, secure, you know, with one another. But now they're not. So this door, we have to assume Nishiki leaves it open because he walks in and doesn't close it. (laughs) So he left it open. So it's almost like leaving the door open is showing that that security is no longer here between them. Because now we have an escape route. We have a way to leave the situation. I was also thinking that, do you think it's just the door open is, whatever's happening is open for discussion? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, except that it never really was. (laughs) (laughs) But no, is it? Because in the next scene, Nishiki, what does Nishiki say? But Nishiki pretty much is implying that there's more to the story than what we know. Well, let's back let's back up a little okay. bit. Sorry, some details from this scene that we've not yet yet discussed. After he reveals that he shot Kazuma, he says he's not dead. Like maybe he didn't even intend to kill him, and he had planted a bug on Shinji and is tracking them. So he knows where they are, but they're, he's not going after them. So what are his intentions? If Nishiki really wanted to betray Kazuma and kill him, he would have done so. Mm-hmm. Nishiki doesn't strike me as a type after going for 10 years. His hands were shaking so bad that he missed the shot. It's not quite a good reason to say that your hands were shaking a lot and then you just missed him instead of headshot. Because why didn't you take the second shot? Because I was just laying there. You could have had like <laughs> 10 minutes worth of like time to re-aim, reload or whatever. And it was open right? season. Right? And so I feel like Nishiki is just telling a story and purposely aim to not kill Kazama. Yeah, you make a good point. And to connect that back to the door, maybe it's a bit more literal symbolism of the door is open. Because he says that he can't go back. But he also didn't shoot to kill. And he doesn't fight Kiryu physically here. So is the door open, leaving the door open for him to go back? Is that more symbolic of, like, hope? I think so. That theory might get destroyed when uh, Nishiki immediately sticks his men on Kiryu. But yeah, Nishiki leaves and it sounds like the plan was if negotiations fell through as they did, then it would be uh, attack Kiryu time. And that's what we see. I feel like when Nishiki is interacting with the other guy, there's like another side plan going on. And I'm even wondering if this is Nishiki being misunderstood and he's just trying to be the bad guy and force Kiryu into either stepping up and become even more angry and aggressive and everything to get him to pave his own way into defeating the top and solving the crimes and everything. Like backing him into a corner so he learns how to fight back. Because maybe Kiryu would have just stayed as a civilian and not want to go back to the Yakuza after that 10 years. I think... My theory includes yours. So here, I think the two options going into this bar from Nishiki would be if Kiryu does not accept 
we attack. <laughs> but if Kiryu does accept, he joins our family. We're still sworn brothers. We do this together. But he never clarifies what accepting means. Well, but I mean, not punching him in the face to start. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was a pretty clear answer. Mm, yes. But I hear you. There mm-hmm. was never really much of an invitation. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just like, give me Haruka, but it wasn't like a, enjoy my family. There wasn't that. And knowing Kiryu, he needs someone to spell it out for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not sure quite what Nishiki's up to yet. But there's two parallels in the scene. So the first parallel is like, no more bromance. And that's very similar to... <laughs> It was a chapter six of Yakuza Zero. Like, the drive. The, yeah, the drive. <laughs> I think the parallel is that there's no more brotherhood and like you're not my brother anymore. Isn't that mm-hmm. pretty much the flip side of Kiryu telling Nishiki to like just leave? And Yeah, because they sort of disband their brothership there too. But that's mm-hmm. protection to protect Nishiki. And now Nishiki's doing it seemingly just out of disagreement. I think it's just Nishiki trying to push Kiryu to get that anger and use that anger to kick everyone's butts we are back in time again with nishiki (laughs) matsushige has the money that he needs for the doctor to pay for the black market organ for his sister but unfortunately that 30 million was from the doctor who i believe borrowed money from the yakuza for gambling and used this money (laughs) that nishiki paid him to pay them back Pretty slick move, let's be honest. (laughs) But tragic. Nishiki figures it out and runs to the hospital. The doctor's gone. He booked it. He skipped town. Back to present timeline. Haruka. She gets kidnapped again. The one place we put her to not be kidnapped. Uh, She gets kidnapped. To be fair, they came in with full force. They used bombs. I can't really blame Date this time around, though. He tried his best. That's true. This time was not his fault. But the building, like, freaking exploded. So, yeah, it really, truly yeah. isn't his fault. They tell Kiryu that it was carried out by a gang who often do dirty work for the Yakuza. While he's tracking down the gang, though, Kiryu gets a call from Date, who tells him that something fishy is going on at the police station because Haruka is listed as a kidnapping victim. But the question is, who reported her as the missing persons? And how did they know she is missing? Yeah, and that's what we don't know. Like, we got that little clip at, in the last episode. But someone is either trying to frame Kiryu or is just really looking for Haruka. Kiryu does track down the gang, and they tell him that they were hired by the Snake Flower Triad and someone named Lao Kaolong, who has her in Chinatown. Kiryu seems to recognize this name, and we see a flashback to 12 years ago. Kiryu's being tortured, but he's rescued by Kazuma. That torture scene was too much for me. I didn't like that. Why did that scene have to be so long? I will say it was so cool because I wanted to just come flying in. That jump was crazy, though. He practically hit his head on the ceiling. (laughs) What was that? Is he wearing moon boots? (laughs) And the thing is that he has, like, a leg that's, like, shot and bleeding, and he's probably going to lose his leg. So it seemed more impressive when you know that. It's kind of funny that you say that because last episode you asked me if we know what happened to his leg and why he's limping, and this Mm. is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now you're like, is he going to lose the leg? <laughs> no, it's just a limp. Why did Kiryu get captured and tortured? Was it for like a fake passport? I didn't really quite get that. Yeah. So from context, it sounds like the Yakuza were running like fake passports. And maybe this was the triad's business. Mm-hmm. And they sort of took it over. Well, it sucks to be Kiryu to be the one who gets captured and tortured. That was painful. Yeah. Real painful. I didn't like that. The whole needle, it's like... Yeah, that's pretty gross. It's like the same kind of needle you stick in a turkey to get the temperature. <laughs> a thermometer? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Wrapping up this gameplay episode, Kiryu and Date are going to head out to Yokohama to find Haruka in Chinatown. And then we see a very interesting meeting between Shimano and Lao. It sounds like they have some kind of arrangement regarding obtaining Haruka. Let's pause real quick because they're talking about cuts. Who gets a cut of what? And so Shimano says that Lao gets three, I believe. 
and Shimano himself would get five. And then Lao says, so who gets the other two? Three, five, and two make up ten. Are we discussing the missing ten billion right now? I think so. So does Shimano have it? No, but he knows that by having Haruka, he'll get the ten million or ten billion. Okay. So that's what I think it means. So this is this is an in progress negotiation. This mm-hmm. isn't a divvying out of the negotiation. Okay. So then in walks Tarada of the Omi Alliance, and he is the one who will be getting the other two. It sounds like he's working with Shimano, but we also know that Nishiki has been working with the Omi Alliance, which Shimano alludes to. Is Shimano just trying to use Nishiki to get to the Haruka and the Ten Billion? Is Tarada playing both sides of Shimano and Nishiki? First of all, I think Tarada is just doing whoever pays him more. He's like a Laogui situation. Mm -hmm. For Nishiki, I don't think that he's going to sell Haruka. The fact that he probably, I hope he feels guilty that Mizuki is dead... I feel like he's going to try to protect Haruka. Like, we don't know when he was asking Kiryu to hand her over if he was going to sell her or protect her in the 10 billion. Like, yeah, we know he wants it. But was he also going to try to protect Haruka while he was at it? And so I don't feel like Nishiki is going to give up Haruka to Shimano. And I think Mm -hmm. he was using Tarada to help him gather intel first. But I don't think they're working together. Okay. So we think Nishi basically... Nishi and the Omi Alliance sort of used each other to get where they are. Mm-hmm. And now the Omi Alliance, Shimano, and Lao have an agreement. But Nishiki's flying solo, mm-hmm. doing his own strategy. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. But I have a gut feeling that Tarada's going to betray Shimano. Well, he's already betrayed Nishiki, sort of, by doing this. So yeah. why wouldn't he do it again? But again with the ten billion. So we have these people discussing how they're gonna distribute it, but we still don't know where it is. Can you have these discussions without having knowledge of where the ten billion is? Or would that be premature if you still don't know where it's at? Well, I think you have to have it because once you have it, then there's no need to negotiate. Or even the location wise, like you have that piece of intel that they don't know. So I feel like it's only okay to negotiate. And I'm even surprised that Lao in Tarada are okay with Shimano having 50% of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what pieces of intel Shimano has to be able to leverage that amount. These are all good questions. And I don't know if we have any any information to really speculate. But I think it sounds like they at least have a buyer lined up. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really all we know so far. Is that they definitely know more than we know. Mm -hmm. But is what they know correct? All right. Okay, I'll count us out. Okay, Audacity on one, three, two, one. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to send in any questions, comments, or game suggestions. You can find all our contact info on our website, replayreviewspod.com, or contact us directly through our site. Did we completely miss something? Are we way off the mark? Or do you just want us to take a deeper look at anything from the game? We'll tackle any topics you all want to hear in our season wrap-up episode. We also have a Reddit where we discuss anything we're curious about. Go take a look and let us know what you're thinking. Our theme music is Condemned by Eggy Toast. They'll play you out and we'll be back next week.